Awesome. So thanks everyone for joining. This is the Cosmos SDK community call. Um, you'll hear me speaking through one computer and also seeing me in another computer as for some reason my computer um, audio does not work. So we have a few things on the agenda and wanted to kind of start off with the Cosmos issue. I believe everyone saw the Cosmos issue that Ethan Frick proposed and just wanted to um, talk about a few of the things. I'm not sure if uh, Frey is here, but also I believe a lot of the concerns um, are shared by other people in the ecosystem. So just wanted to talk about those as well. I am here. I'm sample phone. Oh, OK. <laughs> OK, that makes sense. I was wondering who that was. Um, so um, there's a, there's a, there were a few issues that were mentioned, and um, some, some of them that uh, I was able to digest and iterate on the fastest. And was the first of all, where I want to start with the second bullet point, so non-determinism of maps. So as we saw with the Juno issue, um, events were being used inside the state machine, and there was a non-determinism issue with a certain event that caused a chain halt. Um, and so this issue talks about uh, replacing maps in the SDK with a sorted map or a self-ordering um, data structure. Aaron already commented on it, and so and we talked about it in the SDK call um, last week, and so we'll be able to start work on that um, in the near future, ideally in the next sprint. Um, the, the current sprint was a bit uh, all over the place since I was gone. I'm still technically on vacation, but joining in just so I can uh, so we can talk about some of the concerns raised in the issue. Um, then include events. Well, I wanna, can I can I respond to that last point? I think it's a great move forward. Thank you very much. And it's not just for Cosm Wasm. There's things like going part of the tracing node. It was totally random orders because the modules get committed in random order like a map range in the store as well, right? Which apparently doesn't change the hash because it commits each one of them. And then when it maps them, it then sorts that. And then it does all the sorting, unsorting, or sorting, unsorting. And then it, it, it hashes deterministically. But when you're looking at the order of rights, it's totally different on, even if it's the exact same rights and nodes, it's very hard to find differences um, on reason rights because they get resorted per module. Um, anyway, so I think there's a lot of little things. I'm sure other people have UX things. If you're looking at digging into things that just actually having random orders is kind of annoying. Definitely makes sense. Um, and I think that will come up in the, um, when we begin that work scope. And I think like, yeah, like in the next sprint, um, we'll be able to assign some developers to start going through the SDK and identifying places where uh, we have the potential of non-determinism and in maps and begin working on a solution for this. Um, and we aim, we do want to include this in 047. Um, so this will be part of the next release. Um, so uh, include events in block hash. Um, just wondering who, uh, Frey, did you put that? Yeah, if you're covering the question. I don't know if you want to talk it here, but you don't have to. But that I think was more than the, the non-determinism thing was kind of just came up because we had events in the block hash and we were trusting events to be deterministic. Um, and so the ordering is kind of a sub-issue. It's like annoyings in the code, I think, claim this in general. Um, but the real thing was the desire to have, at least have some determinism in events. And this, I don't know if there's an issue about it. It's come up in the conversations since, like, you know, start years at least. Um, and even before that, um, but I don't know if they ever formalized. Um, so I don't know what, if there's thoughts on that, what the feedback is on that. Is it something we should rely as completely non-deterministic? Um, the, uh, my understanding of non-determinism was never that it was supposed to be non-deterministic per node, just that, that there should be an ability to change them in a patch release rather than a minor release, um, rather than having things like time.time .time or uh, map organization in the events. And that was my understanding. That anything else would be a bug and only the fact is like they want the ability to add them in a point release. And as long as you don't have a patch release upgrade, it should be constant. Um, so yeah, I don't know if there's a desire to have that, the move on it, what the feeling is here. I think it definitely does make sense. And we did talk about it. Um, so this issue even predates, um, I, I think the, it doesn't predate Frey, but it predates most of us in the Cosmos ecosystem. Like this was an issue on Tendermint that was opened in 2018, 2019. And, um, and it was technically resolved, but then it was reverted due to the uh, instability of the IBC events at that time. 
um, just because IBC was just being released. Um, and so that change had to be reverted. But I think we can easily accommodate that from the SDK side. Um, I think there is like two factors, two, two issues, two actions, two actionables from um, this exact thing is like first define what non-determinism is inside of events. Um, and you are right, like part of the events was like they should be deterministic in the events. But um, the reason why they weren't added to the block hash was so they can change in minor releases instead of having to wait for uh, major releases or chain upgrades. Um, and I think that like um, we didn't define that what non-determinism exactly meant within the SDK. And so that's definitely something we should um, add to our documentation as well. Yes. So events should be deterministic. Just the question, the question still remains in state machine version is the right frame, right? Like, what do we want events to be used for versus uh, method responses? Like, I mean, we you could state machine version every event. Like, this is a decision that can be made that is reasonable, or we could not. Like, uh, you know, our events for data integrators are like state machine. Whatever is used for state machine composability must be a state machine version. Um, but it's unclear to me if this is what we want events for uh, to be used for right now versus like we want to get should we just get message responses to be uh, for that purpose? Or then the issues and just make message responses less like half baked and like properly integrated. I would say that we should probably drive for message responses because the the main benefit I see from uh, events not being state machine versioned and I've this has been proven to be true numerous times in the past is that you have the ability to introduce very useful and almost necessary events uh, in point releases without having to break or require an upgrade. Um, we did this for like, uh, we did this for um, uh, being able to query by uh, signature, which um, uh, addressed various transaction malleability concerns. There were also clients that requested events to be added to make their lives easier that we added in point releases. So if you introduce that into the state machine, you kind of lose that. That's the main benefit you lose. Um, yeah, I just wanted to point that out. We can also imagine events being the main source of like any data integrator. So you can have data integrators have optionality, like tracing right now has a different UX. Like this is a thing that could go through events and someone opts into getting it. Like we want a unified data integrator. UX. I'm not saying that's a, that's a decision. It's good. It's just like that is an option for. Uh... So the reason is, is it all is. Can you guys hear me now? Don't... Yeah. Okay. Go go go, um, Ethan, and then I'll speak. Okay. So I was going to say what the other option that the different is actually a valid option. The problem is that um, almost every message type I've seen there, the message response is empty or minimal data, and if you want to know what happened, you pretty much have to look at the events to reconstruct the message. Um, in fact, most of the explorers reconstruct it. So the other option of actually making those full fledged and say, we're going to make all the data fields are already hashed, actually usable, and we don't need any more than those to actually reconstruct what happened would also be a very valid approach. That's just our bad. We've been not good about populating the response to objects. There's no rhyme or reason to that. We just, just simply didn't do it. Yeah. So. Um... I posted a discussion there that uh, we had uh, last year about event hooks. Um, and I mean, the idea is that basically you could, this would this would introduce events into the state machine in a way that a module could, another module could observe the events. And, 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 we, and you could safely do what's being done in Cosmwasm um, now. What I, what I was proposing that we do is basically separate the type of events which are in consensus and ones that aren't in consensus um, and the general just the proposal was is we have events that, that are uh, we have typed events which we partially um, you know transition some modules use those and we have on typed events which are basically the um, you know the key value pairs that um, that tendermint accepts um, and the proposal was that the typed events be part of the state machine and be deterministic and there's still a way to have these these legacy kind of um, you know, key value pairs that could be updated in patch releases and could be, you know, modified on the fly if people need it without um, affecting the determinism of the app. What's the advantage of having more. that than 
putting that information in a, a data response. So I mean, maybe like listening to data responses yeah. is also yeah. possible, right? That's that's something that we discussed. I mean, my my um, point around that is that an event like so there there's cases where you have one process um, executing a node process through a message and. Um, you know, AuthZ is one case of this. I, I'm pretty sure Cosmwasm does this, where you can send a message from a Cosmwasm uh, contract. Um, so when that happens, the client is not going to get the response of the message back. Um, but an event well, will tell you that something has happened at some point, regardless of what caused it to happen. So for uh, for AuthZ, they should have a uh, right. It's, it's true. Copying any right that like that that uh, that includes then the any for uh, any response in the chain. I I guess like I guess the, the the broader point though is like say for instance you have something which moves coins, um, like message send is one thing that moves coins, but there are other things that move coins via keeper methods on bank. Um, if you want to know that coins have been moved. An event is something that tells you that that has happened, regardless of what caused that to happen, whether it was a message or calling a keeper method, or 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 there was two messages that messages that cause the same thing to happen. An event tells you that something has happened um, in a sort of uniform way. That's at least my proposal for what a typed event means and and the semantics around that. Well, that seems worth typing. I mean, that just says that like. Mm -hmm. uh, well, like you can do that right now, right? Events are made of data integrators. They can just uh, like um, these are all appended in the transaction execution. It's just a matter of um, like the typing is now is not uh, well structured. Like that seems orthogonal to this problem, and just like are integrators unhappy with the current event type? Mm -hmm. So I think this is. Which may pull us out, let uh, go on to other issue points. Um, my basic point is the idea of uh, there's two possibilities here, basically. One is refining what events are, um, whether that's making them included in app hash, whether that's involved uh, making them typed, um, and you know things in general, like there should be uh, listeners, you know, and make them more structured and, and you know, documented, et cetera. Uh, that's useful in any case, I think, uh, that documentation for clients. The client side stuff is always an event, right? Um, inside the blockchain, uh, I'm not sure it's actually good to use them, but whatever, that's another choice. But I think we have to improve them anyway for client side. So the question is, uh, we have to make improvements on them. Do you also make them deterministic? Or do you put all enough information to reconstruct deterministic in the data field, which is used for any on-chain stuff like off Z passing it on there? Um, Cosmosm does. Call these sub messages. The events from all the sub messages are passed up to the top. You can optionally choose if you have four sub messages to pass the data from one of the sub messages up back to the original caller. You, you can't, can pass one of them back, but it has to decide what to do with those. So, um, but you know, if it was important, we could do it. But I think events are just guaranteed to be there. So I think that's great for clients. Well, one other note on the events, um, and sorry, I'm a little late, guys. Uh, I know Dev had a proposal recently to make refactor hooks into more of an event uh, bus style architecture. If we put events into consensus, we could potentially throw them down the event bus and have them consumed by other modules. So, uh, especially if they're deterministic. I mean, the question's like, uh, you can have a, a bus for uh, hooks and stuff, and is events for clients? And then if so, then module and same responsibility is, is a distinct role from clients, right? It, I, I definitely agree here that it's like defining what events should, um, better documentation around events, um, what determinism means and not determinism means for events, who is their preferred customer. And then the sec then that's like already like one point. Um, and then the next one would be, I think the cleanest approach is definitely like message response being populated with the data that is required from the state. Um, and that used within the state machine for now, and then later on, things like um, potentially like ADR33 or other things um, that could help uh, uh, either bring back the notion of events within the state machine. But I think um, once we have that definition of events and also we get better at populating the message response fields, then we kind of have um, the separated distinctions for who events are for and who events are for not. 
cool. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, that does make sense. I, I mean, deterministic events would make relayer code a lot more simple. <laughs> like we're heavy users of the event stream. Um, you know, we had to that, that's rewrite like a, a bunch of stuff recently. Um, we we should fix that anyways, no matter what. Um, so this kind of goes in line with what non-determinism events means. Um, so uh, wrote those down. Um, then so, uh, can I understand just just to cover for, for my use case, particular, which I think a lot of use cases here. Some really important events is for important for lots of people. For my use case for cosmosm, um, we should assume that we don't use events, don't ever count events, and assume that in a soon to upcoming release SDK module data that field should be better populated yes we are our plans for the next like you know five six months the, the 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 message response so ideally um yeah so the the to do's there is like for me to write an epic for us to quickly discuss um if it needs any discussion and then we begin working on populating those um those uh, those that, that data field for use within the state machine um as aaron what do you guys think of that? I mean, yeah, we should totally pop out those uh, responses. Yeah, I would like, I mentioned this earlier, I think the ideal approach is to populate responses, keep events uh, deterministic, but not versioned in the state machine. I, I think, uh, personally, think that uh, one thing is very important for blockchains with virtual machines, because the final states only indicate uh, what uh, the final result, but uh, for uh, for contracts, for smart contracts, we have to know uh, what we did to reach this final result. So event is very important. It's a very important signal for use cases like uh, event hooks and even uh, many other event based event drive uh, mechanisms. So I'm strange at the first time that I know that events a lot part of the uh, consensus is not included in the block hash. Block hash. So I think uh, I strongly agree with you that we should include uh, events in block hash. Yeah. So we can know uh, the process. For example, we can know any is transferred to Bob. Yeah, it's very important. Uh, uh, actions. So this would be the idea of populating message responses. So then um, you could use the message response in the same way. Mm, but uh, mm, message responses, mm, but you uh, want some more uh, smart contracts can define its specific events. Uh, it's uh, uh, it has a fixed uh, structure, and I think uh, events is more uh, is more usable for for the smart contracts. Yeah, I agree. I, I think uh, uh, I think this is difference for what. Okay, so imagine a VM, right? Like I do a VM function call. Oh, the, you have two options. One is like you can instrument things for clients, like you know, at the end, like you know, intercept every contract contract call call or uh, sorry the claim of like events is that they're for clients right now then it's up to the VM of our power wants to communicate things to clients then if you want SDK VM composability or like cross message composability that's a second thing of okay how does the VM communicate what it, the data it needs to get composed and then like that could be in a message response or it means something different like it's still the VM's job, and uh, to do. Uh, I, guess I don't understand the difference between message response and event for this. Like, it, it's about defining what is uh, what does the VM want to communicate to clients, or does it want to communicate to other SDK or other uh, state machine composability? So we should go clarify this. Uh, the message response is a data field is passed back. It's included in the block hash. It's also passed in to contracts. The data field of the message on the reply block. You get that one. And it's a protobuf encoded object which is defined in the message services um, for every thing. That's what currently exists. The problem is that it's usually an empty structure everywhere, or a few places have a little data in it. But the fact is, it is currently passed through. Um, and we Do use that to parse it. So when we parse out 
um, when you call another contract and you have these like, we have uh, CW tills to parse this out, um, we actually parse out from the data blob. We parse the data out from the data blob. So we have examples of it in, in Cosmosm code. Um, I don't know if we have too much in Cosmosm specifics here, but I just wanted to let you know that's possible now. With the Goric, uh, sorry, with, with the Goric, we're, we're observing uh, events to get uh, uh, notice of uh, bank balance changes so that we can reflect that up into our our generalization of of uh, of uh, bank balances and you know uh, just like was described before events kind of consolidate uh, that that incident regardless of which particular message type or or keeper call or whatever uh, cause that so it would be very non-modular for it, for us to somehow know all possible messages which might affect uh, 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 bank balances. That definitely makes sense, and that yeah, that's I think like an immediate thing that uh, uh, events did suffice. Um, do you feel like the you the message response approach, like if the same data is um, if the same data is outputted via message response, would well, you be able to do that? Or? Wait, no, no, events should be, everything that's in a message response should get automatically, should automatically have an event still created for yeah. it. So, uh, yeah. Like the event doesn't go away for this yeah. client's tracking. I mean, I think that Jim was just saying that there's like the, you, you don't know how many different types of messages could have caused that thing to happen. Yeah, and it's Thank impractical you. for us to monitor if, you know, every module and every message to to every module to and and trace the flow of what could possibly affect a bank balance. You know, you know, a, a hook mechanism uh, would would also suffice. Something where the where the bank balance just says, "I'm going to you know kind of make a note, you register here to get notified of every balance change." But the uh, events are what we have today. Yeah, I mean, this the other the other thing about event hooks, like the reason why this proposal came up is there there are hooks in several modules, which are these interfaces like staking hooks, um, and there have been other hooks added in other places. And generally, the pattern that I've seen is these hooks are always called right at the same time the event is embedded. So there's like this redundant thing happening where we now are creating a inside state machine way of observing this event which is the hook and we're also emitting events and so i'm proposing you to find those like i, I feel like the, the the conclusion should be that like let's make state machine thing emit client data not let's make client data emit uh, state machine action like like I'm sorry i'm not following but that's like, what i was trying to say earlier too Dev. i i agree with that but like uh so if events are client data, like a response or a call, then be federated via the framework, like the app framework, uh, to then generate cli a client event. Uh, like versus right now, you can find both, or or the proposal of like make events the trigger for app actions or state machine actions. I'm not sure why we can do both. I guess I'm just not following the distinction you're making there. Um, that uh, like event hooks, at least to me, sounds where we start from like client data can ultimately have action, uh, like uh, actions, whereas I think what it should be is, uh, is uh, state machine action just generates client data as well to the you know, client. Can can I promote? I agree with all these points here. I just want to say I think it deserves a whole breakout session. It seems that there are a lot of people actually very interested in events and a lot of different use cases for events, um, and they are clearly a very poorly defined um, arbitrary system now that is being used for many many critical things. Um, so we should be very careful to change anything about it. Um, I think this requires just a whole meeting just about events or two. But like yeah, uh, maybe I will, I don't want to take up the whole meeting. I had that little point here. I think it's a good discussion. I would like to just pull the table up for now and we can cover the other things. And Mark, I have many other points on the table. Definitely a good point. Thank you for that. Um, I'll organize a breakout session sometime early next week, and then we can kind of kick it off from there on defining needs 
uh, for everyone that is currently using events um, so we can get a better understanding. Um, the next one, the next cause of Muslim concern was uh, guarantees around determinism of priorities. So currently there isn't a way to um, make guarantees around the API of queries. Um, and so uh, within Cosmosm, like let's say if you were to modify a query um, and release it in the point release, then um, it's on kind of the Cosmosm team or the team upgrading um, the version to be aware that that change may cause like a non-determinism across their network. And so is there a way to provide um, guarantees around certain queries that they will be um, API compatible um, towards the previous versions. And so talking with Frey, talking with Dave, um, kind of working towards regression tests, test vectors on certain queries, and then that will help us provide a white list of queries that guarantees are being made about. Um, and I think this, like even in the future, if we do, when we do uh, code gen of queries and CLI and all those things, these tests will still be useful to make sure that we aren't causing more breakage for our users. Um, one more point issue. about query determinism, we're working on an IBC queries implementation where the query response comes back in the acknowledgement. So uh, right now we're sort of like whitelisting deterministic queries. This would allow us to offer a lot more coverage with IBC queries. So with the thing with IBC queries that I'm, I'm, I'm still kind of lost on, is it like an ABCI query or is it like a state machine? It's, so there's two different implementations. One is a uh, ABCI query implementation, and that does not require anything on the counterparty chain, but you only get raw key value store queries because it requires the proof to bring it into the state machine on the querying chain. So some people are going to go to market with that early, but the more long-term solution for IBC queries is to just expose state machine queries. And those are going to be via a call and response type thing. The querying contract or module would open a channel with a common query module on the queried chain. And then it would send over the proto for the query the queried chain would process that and send back the query response in the acknowledgement. Um, we have a working implementation for this. Justin, if I, I know Justin's on here. Justin, if you want to post the, the IBC test example you have um, with a working test example, if anyone wants to take a peek at that. But the way that we're currently getting around the non-determinism issue is just the chain that's exposing queries to other chains says, I'm exposing these queries. And right now, that list of queries that we can expose is relatively short. Yeah. So I'll just jump in. I we have a besides the IBC query, which is a very complex thing. We had this for a long time in Cosmosm, called Stargate query, which we allowed a we allowed a uh, contract to query arbitrary program buff and get program response back, right? For things we not added. Just like that quickly hit the point that were things that we, I understood that there was this big push in the refactor. I thought it was a forty six, or maybe I was totally off about ADRs using message messages and query gRPC queries internally as a heavy thing. I understood this as the architecture. Um, so given the architecture, I was assuming these would be more or less. The first thing I countered is things like no data is also a gRPC query and like TX mempool stuff is. So clearly we had to get rid of these, these right? There's obviously uh, things that didn't belong there. So, okay, well, fine. Let's just put the things that were clearly like, you know, belong to a module in that module, right? Rather than other ones, your tenement stuff. Um, so, okay, cool. Let's just go to the app module stuff. And that was our first issue we hit, right? Um, that was our bad for not double checking all these things. Um, the second one is it came out, it wasn't just a point release thing. It was that some of these things apparently have maps in them. Again, non-deterministic ordering inside, not point release changing it, but actually just having random ordering inside queries, which was apparently totally cool, but that actually would break anything if you used it um, outside. So the ordering of a, a slice would be random. Um, that's problematic. So uh, then I asked if anything could. There's no guarantees given. So I said, I'm just enabling them all. I'm afraid to enable anything, period. Um, if the SDK says, OK, bank staking modules, all queries on the bank and staking modules are guaranteed to be deterministic, then we can whitelist those and say, OK, you can, we, you know, cause a module which was two or three of those, right? But if you want to call anything else on the bank and staking module, we'll allow you to use those, nothing else, right? So. And t basically what I want is, I don't need them all deterministic, which is totally fine, they cannot be. Um, but if there's a guarantee, like on a module and module basis saying, okay, we guarantee that these are deterministic 
and any changes the query a response on this module will only be done in a you know a breaking upgrade a hard fork um then we're totally cool right and just have that list documented and then that would help ibc query icqs whatever ibc queries as well anything else cosmosm we say okay these are the queries that we actually can trust um and have it well defined because right now i say okay i think these are deterministic but maybe they change them in a patch release i don't know right i have no actual guarantees so it's dangerous makes sense makes sense um, yeah, we can definitely uh, already get open an epic on that, and so we can definitely start working back um, from the modules in the SDK. It sounds like um, uh, staking and bank are the highest concern for you. They're the ones people usually ask about. I think accounts is another one people ask about. Um, I think the pain. I personally think it's a pain to parse the data out because you get like these any fields of the same accounts or any custom account, account types, but that has come up. Um, maybe Dev has other ones if you ask him about. Uh, yeah, we have a list somewhere. I will uh, go check it. Sunny has a PR. Uh, yeah, I'll find it. Like, like people do want to be able to query some address to find the pub key from it. You know, if an address has called them, they find out whether the pub key, you know, the pub key, for example, a sign or stuff like that. Um, which is interesting in this case, because it's general caller. We find out the contract has a pub key. Anyway, I think these are things that like. That people kind of wanted, and it's like you know, I say you can't do it. Period. But having said, okay, we have a way of at least doing the off queries. They can figure out what you're doing it on top of that. Yeah, a general concern for us is also because something that was actually something I was opposed to before, but I think I was wrong. Uh, was that like we don't have gas counting for queries, and uh, so because of that in our white listing, we're excluding anything that has like long iterators. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess un until we get like uh, gas counting, uh, we can't really expose that safely. Well, also, what do you mean? Counting happens on the data, the state read, not the CPU usage. Oh, the query will uh, has a gas counter when you when you're running it. Yeah. Um. So if you run it, if, if you, you look, run it via a message, yes. So oh, if you if you inside a message, you're right. It um it does that, and it's only data read, but it, it actually against it takes it against your thing. So if you call those queries in Cosmos or whatever else, or any sort of query keeper, it will burn down your gas based on the reads. In the database what is dangerous is if they can expose a query from a um from a client there's nothing we currently hard code in cosmos we call a wasm query you can obviously make an infinite loop in your contract upload it and then just query it and then you kind of freeze whatever century node you hit right um which is annoying so we currently have like a 300k gas limit for queries configured on node by node basis um for wasm queries just for wasm queries called from externally right um that's what we have in there are you running queries via the Go method rather than like the gRP server? Because if you're running the gRPC server, that should uh, that should have that should be during a new context. But if you're running the Go method, like, that does make sense. I didn't think about it. Yeah, call it Go. We don't do the gRPC server. Uh, okay. Uh, that makes sense. Oh, cool. I got Cosmos and handles that. Nice. One thing on the interchain queries example here. Um, Staking and bank are the two big ones that, that I've heard people express use cases for. Um, P2P validator is interested in this and, and for their interchain staking implementation. Um, and that's what they would need. But we also have a team using uh, Osmosis custom modules. So as we're developing this, uh, like, i.e., finding pool balances and, and things like that. Um, so as we're developing this method to sort of certify some. Uh, deterministic queries, if that can be generalized for app developers as well, that would be great. Uh, I mean, so uh, for Osmosis, we were having something in our next release that is going ahead and doing this, uh, like a whitelist. I kind of figured you would be, but yeah. You, you guys you guys do a lot of best practices. You know, it's just other folks that, that come on is, is what I'm a bit more worried about. Awesome. I'm going to pause it right there just since we already have, um, there's a lot of good takeaways from this and a lot of things we can work on um, and a lot of things that we can already start working on now. Um, so the the last bullet point is uh, some an issue Dave opened and also Frey mentioned in the uh, issue, but um, governance proposal type. So with 046 governance, um, everything moved to like a message base and so there's not a notion of uh, proposal types. So in the scenario that you want to do special voting parameters per proposal type, 
Um, I don't believe this would be possible with the new design. Um, Aaron or uh, anyone who was working on the gov, uh, gov work, correct me if I'm wrong in saying that. I mean, there, there's no uh, provision for special voting periods per message type now, but you could do that uh, based on the message type. But, uh, just think, mm -hmm. but it, this becomes like quickly very messy if I need to be making like a uh, forking the gov module to add a classifier for multi messages. Like, I, I, I'd rather. But why would you need to fork the gov module? Why don't you just we just have a feature to support per per message type uh, parameters? But I, I, when you say multi message becomes very not clean. Oh, like if you have multiple um, messages in a single proposal. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, this is something to to probably to brainstorm about. There was at the time we were building this a whole uh, gov groups, a working group discussing these kind of issues as they came up, um, and and maybe we kind of, you know reconvene a group of people to think through the, this through or like if you have a proposal like i think that there's probably some way to deal with it well i i feel like answers like you keep types and then you you make the execution method of everything array estimate a message but you still have a, a type and then you uh the type can have a validate function as well what is it's like param what is the message is parameterized with hmm. like I, I just that being uh, being messed with makes sense it's uh, it's just the removal of types that, and, and like you know, you can have custom displays recommended per type, etc. So, but what are the per, per proposal types that uh, parameters that you're wanting to have? Uh, so for osmosis, like we want like incentive updates, a contract upload process, um, uh, then generic message execution, funding, and like yeah, for funding maybe we need to wait two weeks to vote, whereas for and. Uh, Whereas for an in, uh, incentive update, maybe it's like a two-day vote, and like maybe we have different voting parameters, voting structures for each, like rather than just, you know, maybe it's not fifty percent, fifty percent of a chain for incentive update. Maybe it's like thirty percent, but uh, higher weight to nose or something. All right. So you want a feature that allows different voting parameters based on the proposal type, and I mean, the question is how to do it with multi messages. Is that like? What it comes down to? Look, no, 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 no. I, I want no. I even want it to be the case that like I can have a type uh, of. Uh, or, yeah, okay, I, yeah. I guess different one, different different sets of messages to have different voting uh, voting periods, like or voting parameters, etc. We're happy to, we're implementing these. Just like we want to have uh, types that be consistent with like client side with the rest of the DK, where and we all want to give every uh, proposal type a different display method. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean the so I mean the design around this that that was basically brainstorm and and, and is partially uh, partially works now. The idea is that and, and some of the use cases we were working from <laughs> was the idea that you could have um, different like subgroups of, of uh, individuals voting on specific things. And so the, that the gov module would work smoothly with Auth Z and with groups so that you could say, okay, um, we're actually like the governance is actually gonna delegate this functionality to a group. Um, and, and that could be done on a per message basis. And so the way that you would deal with what you're saying there, Dave, um, is that you'd basically have a group where the voting um, body of the group is actually the the same uh you know governance staking body but the group has a different set of um a proposal um has a different set of voting parameters than the main governance so like the whole idea was to move more towards like a configurable group type model and so i think you would end up with the same thing and and that you basically say okay this group this group is delegated to vote on these proposals um and it has its parameters, and as long as it, it has an authorization to execute those things, it can do that. Wait. Okay, so I agree with like there is multiple parts. So I, I feel like I have a type type of proposal. That proposal mm -hmm. has a um, a group of who is like the voting denominator, and then it has a function for like decide vote results, 
comma group comma group member votes and like it, like these are but, but it's like type proposals are a thing that makes sense for our type proposal this type proposal has this group and this like voting function but but so like i guess the thing that i'm 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 saying is different in the design that we have and that like that that i think would deal with the same thing you're saying in a different way is we wouldn't dispatch on the type of message we would dis like we wouldn't dispatch based on okay if it's this message it has these voting parameters we would say if it's this group making the decision and it has this group policy like the design is with the group policy with these parameters that's what will apply the proposal will be executable if it's authorized so that's like just the difference in terms of how this is designed i think it's i think the same thing is envisioned it's just a different way of it being composed is that are you following what i'm saying yeah you can have a uh you, you can say that like i set this group to have um this uh execution permission for this message type um and it has a, 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 a it has that it has its decision policy so this group's decision policy is you know say one week and it could be the same body it could be the same group of, of voters but mm -hmm. it's just a different decision policy it, like and you assign that decision policy the right to execute such and such messages on behalf of governance. Um, so that would work as long as the subset of things that got proposed are all things that are authorized. Otherwise, it would fail because there's no authorization to do that with that voting window. I see. Uh, I think that uh, suffices. I, I still find that a weird. Uh, well, okay, so. Okay, I think I understand this abstraction. Uh, think about it for I'll, I'll find for a bit. Yeah, and maybe this is something where we can like break out, you know, um, and 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 do kind of a, um, you know, come back to or maybe in a smaller group and, you know, talk with like you know Sam and you know Noam who are also working on this the gov and groups kind of design. Mm -hmm. um, awesome. Um, yeah, definitely a breakout session for that as well. And then also would love to get other people involved there, um, more so users of the Cosmos SDK developing applications. Um, I feel like we uh, that's something that we didn't have enough feedback on in the initial um, design. But um, so we have 13 minutes. Um, I want to kind of go through some of the WX points um, that were brought up. Um, so outside of the Cosmos and concerns, there was uh, isolation of errors. Um, so essentially, um, uh, so basically, well, Dave, you want to, I, I misunderstood that first. Do you want to take it away with the problem with isolation of errors? Uh, yeah, that um, right now, like any panic in the state, in the code, uh, if it's in begin block or end block, halts your chain. A lot of errors it, uh, then get cast to panics in such situations. It's kind of SQL default. And this is like not great. Um, like most chains would probably not prefer halting in these situations. Uh, so then you have this like kind of annoying audit task of like, is my chain going to halt uh, due to a, a, an unforeseen panic? And you kind of have to always assume unforeseen panics are possible because of like oddities in like store and stuff. Um, so it would be nice, and something we do in some of our code is that if it's in, if it's begin block or end block logic, uh, or uh, certain hook logic that is in begin block, we add uh, the ability for like panic recovery, uh, like a, a form of printing that stack trace to uh, printing it out, uh, like so we can see in logs. But otherwise, proceeding the chain, where like, we're saying we are white box guaranteeing that like. We are okay if this modern end block has a panic. Don't halt our chain. Just like log it and just keep receiving. Uh, or in, in you know in some cases we even want to override that where it's like okay this this module had a panic but uh, we still deem it as like uh, we deem this as halt worthy even though the rest of it isn't. So like and make this wrap this panic with a signal that uh, it is chain halt panic. Uh, and I, I think this like would just would dramatically reduce complexity of auditing the stuff of like if we uh, could express a guarantee at the top of a module like maybe in like uh, maybe in the wiring layer or maybe in like a config per mod in the module go that says that like 
should uh, what is the panic catch behavior we want? Like, if do we want to recover on panic, or do we want to uh, halt the chain on panic in this in this begin block end block code, or uh, and then express some for some form of signal in for the module manager layer that like even if you uh, recover from panics, if you start with this prefix or your panic is an error that inherits this type, like you know if it wraps this error type, so it's still all nicely typed. Um, still a halt anyway. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, no, I was going to say this definitely makes sense um, that for something to do just so um, people can define their own guarantees of the modules they're writing. Um, I think that'd be definitely useful. Um, Bez, Aaron, what are your takes? Yeah, I mean, it's very straightforward to me. I don't have any issues with it. I think uh, the only thing that we need to decide is how to actually design and, and, and kind of expose that API. But I think it's, pretty, it's a pretty straightforward request. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Awesome. And then the second second bullet point kind of wraps up into the core API walkthrough. Um, but with the last 10 minutes, uh, we can quickly run through the core API walkthrough. Um, and then we can kind of like talk on those points. Um, the uh, make Apple app module basic stateless methods on app module struct um, definitely makes sense. I need to write an epic um, as it's like an easy, it's a simple win. Um, if we choose to uh, opt over that, and if API needs more uh, design work, but Aaron, you want to take it around the core API stuff? Sure. Um, yeah, I could um, share screen. Show this. Actually, how do I share screen with this Google? Right, let me see. Do I have to... Um, can Present you see now my, is the button. Can you see my um my IDE here? Yes. Yeah. You can see uh, uh, like where I'm. I have uh, the ADR yep. here. Okay, great. Um, okay, this is a rather long ADR, and given the short amount of time, I'm not sure. Um how to how to cover this in a succinct way um but i'll, I'll try my best um so as i actually have this uh pr um kind of bundled together with some updates to an early earlier adr on app wiring so i consider these two pieces to go together the app wiring and the core module um and you know part of that is just based on the fact that when we were designing these um these designs got discussed together um and kind of came together as a package um i i would i do want to so app wiring depends heavily on dependency injection um but i do want to say that recently we've made a change um to um that we're going to also have a code generation with app wiring so that you can um either use runtime dependency injection or compile time um or you can even manually wire things um and that would basically look like uh a co-generator generating your app.go. So that's just a preface to this core module API. Um, so the, the core um, API basically proposes a, uh, a replacement set of APIs for the existing app module, app module basic, um, and as well as the uh, SDK uh, context type. Um, and so um, there's, there's a number of reasons why I'm proposing this um, these changes, um, and you know, one of the biggest reasons is to have basically a stable, um, uh, loosely coupled set of of um, interfaces and patterns that that make it easier to um, uh, easier to implement modules that are stable between um, different versions. Um, so that, that's one big part here is making it possible to have a version of a module that works with multiple versions of the SDK or multiple versions of other modules. Um, uh, the system is also designed to be more extensible, 
hopefully simpler and also to enable some of the things we've been discussing today, such as deterministic events and queries um, and wow. event listeners or event hooks um, and ADR33, which kind of relies on deterministic queries. Um, ADR33, for those of you that don't recall, is about having intermodule messages and message and query passing. Um, since we're just five minutes from the end of the call, I want to just try to very quickly just give a high level overview of what is in this ADR without going through everything. Um, so basically there's two parts of how um, this core API would work. Uh, there are services um, and based on, on a dependency injection type approach, a module asks for the services it needs. Um, and it also provides other services to other modules in the form of keepers and, and other things potentially. Um, core services are uh, store um, events for emitting events, um, getting information about blocks, uh, gas, and then in client connection interface, which is basically the way you use ADR 33. Um, so one big bundle of this proposal is a set of core services. And then the other big part is um, uh, this core handler struct, which should be the replacement for the app module and define the things that a module would um, return to the framework um, in order to get wired together. Um, and there's a bunch of text explaining that and, and you know the rationale for things. Um, the other other thing I just want to say is that the idea is that the core um, this core API is an, is an, is an API that defines the services and, and this handler struct and the way things work, but it doesn't provide the implementation, and that the implementation would be provided by what we're calling a runtime module, um, and the runtime module would encapsulate what is currently base app and that then the module manager and all of that stuff, um, and and this runtime module could potentially support. Um, modules that implement the existing legacy app module, um, you know, interfaces um, to allow kind of backwards compatibility, um, but, but you know, could could evolve and, and there could be different variations of um, the runtime module that are forked depending on if people have needs for things like uh, plugins for state listening, like the ADR38 stuff, um, or maybe they're they're want. Some people want a uh, you know a legacy Tendermint version of runtime um, and also an ABCI plus plus if you know and to have those two kind of living side by side unless there's some in case there's some more conservativeness about upgrading. So um, that's the basic framing. We have three minutes left. Um, I'm going to pause and just. Um... I also just want to add that like this um, this also isn't dependent on like dep inject. Um, you can still construct a app go folder file. Um, yeah, and everything manually if you wish. Yeah, the, the thing is that it is more. Um, the idea is that it's more that Dep Inject provides functionality to make this a really ergonomic way to do things. That's just one kind of thing to keep in mind is that the idea of of services is the paradigm of asking for what you need, and then the framework provides it. Um, and that and dep dependency injection makes that much easier. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. But yeah, totally the idea is that it can be manually wired and you don't have to use dep inject. So. Can I ask a very meta comment here? I think the design's very nice. One thing I've seen historically is any major change to architecture, there's major changes that can be made that make SDK better. I totally agree. The SDK can have huge major overhauls and improve a lot of things. Um, since Stargate is a really hard one, a lot of people stuff for, stuff for the upgrade, there's really huge resistance from chains to actually do any like kind of major API breakage. Um, I wonder if there's something that can be made in a relatively non-breaking way without losing all the strength, or maybe it's better to even have like another module system that kind of, I don't know, to have another version of SDK that actually like is a much more composable, like a V2 SDK or something in so, parallel. Yeah. I'm not sure. It's more it meta. It was touched on at the bottom that it's like um, it will work with like the runtime module will work with the uh, app module and app module basic. Um, so people won't have to upgrade right away if they choose not to. Yeah, I mean, and the, and I just want to point out that's maybe one thing that there's been a little bit of maybe debate about is that I, I intentionally cho chose like an approach here where I didn't introduce a lot of breakage to the existing app module and SDK context because I wanted that to work. 
in parallel with this new API that could be selectively upgraded. So you could have three modules using app module SDK context, four modules that get upgraded to the core API, and the, and the upgrade and, and migrating to core API could be a slow thing that happens over a period of time and maybe two years out, you know, eventually app module gets totally deprecated or whatever. That's the idea. Uh, I feel like I haven't, I don't say I, I don't quite got the details of it. Like I remember I got from the high level of the most recent year in the past, but I, I find the focus on modularizing a lot of the core a bit odd versus like making the current core like much safer and much uh, cleaner. Like uh, I, I currently feel like the current core is like a very bloated and uh, like uh, bloated interfaces that are also relatively unsafe to put guns. And rather than focus on like making a very refactor stack, I think is a, a good goal. Uh, I feel like just the amount of low hanging fruit to like make the current thing much more usable. Yeah, I mean, there's there's different approaches. I mean, just one thing I would say um, is the, the the context in which this this grew out of the um, you know there were some people you know in in our kind of team that were were pushing for some relatively radical changes and and at the time when we designed this that was kind of the direction we took where it was like um that a couple of people had actually done a proof of concept of a totally new sdk um so this was kind of to balance like the desire from actually like the um um the all in bits team to have a totally new sdk with compatibility and so like I'm I'm sure we could do do other different things. This could have evolved differently if I had been a different group of people. Um, so, you know, I, I I do think like um, I think there is a there is a world, and I think we are going in that world. But it's like we're doing both because um, there are like a lot of simple wins, small wins that are like on that module, and be it that like we will provide keep maintaining the app module interface. For let's say two, three years, um, giving people sufficient time to migrate with the fact of compatibility guarantee of like the core API, then I do think it is worth spending some time on fixing those interfaces, just doing some minor cleanup, just to make it more ergonomic. And then when people migrate in the future, then they get this new API. But in the in the current time, they can already like, experience some better ergonomics. Um, so I think that's definitely um, something we can work towards, um, and something that we can keep in mind. Um, I have to run to walk the dog. He's uh, crying, so I'm gonna end, I'm gonna end the call here. Thanks everyone Marco. for joining. Yeah. Marco, can we talk EDE test next week? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks right. everyone. Thanks so much for taking the time, Marco. Ciao. Ciao. Yeah. Thanks everyone.